My challenge today is to tell all who will listen to what God has to say how to get out of debt. God has, like in every other area, an answer to your financial dilemma. The problem is that God can get people, including his people, to pay attention. And as a result, the addiction to debt has become the newest form of slavery. Proverbs 22, 7 says, the borrower is a slave to the lender. And many people know what it is to be enslaved to bills, to be owned by them. In our story, in verse 1 of 2 Kings, we have a single parent who can't pay her bills. Her husband has died. The provider for the home is not there. She cannot make ends meet and finds herself subjected to the creditors. Being subjected to the creditors has placed her whole family in disarray. For she says, they've come to take my two sons, that is, to work off the debt. Many families know what it is to be disturbed by bills. Instead of planning for the future, we live our lives paying for the past. Because if you owe $8,000 and you pay minimum payments, you're going to be paying for 21 years and have paid $21,000 to liquidate that expense. It will own you. Let me be inextricably clear here. Illegitimate debt is to be abnormal, not normal in the life of the believer. Therefore, if you are living in debt, if you have more month than money, it is because you are living outside of the will of God. God makes it clear in Psalm 37 verse 21, the wicked borrow and do not pay. He describes it as wickedness. Debt does not mean the absence of bills. Debt is having bills you do not or cannot pay. This lady goes to the prophet. In other words, she made a spiritual connection, which is why she went to the prophet. She needed God to intervene in her circumstances. It is unfortunate today that believers separate God from the subjects of economics and finance. Luke 16 verses 10 and 11 says that if God can't talk to you in this area, he will not talk to you in other areas. He says, if I can't trust you here, then I can't trust you elsewhere. Because this is an indicator light of whether you take God seriously. Illegitimate debt exists for a number of reasons. Number one, there is ignorance of God's method of handling your resources. People just don't know. If they knew, they would do it, but they, they've never been told about it. So some people just don't know it. Some people know it and don't like it. Like a lot of things in scripture, they reject it. And so they have to bear the consequences of their rejection. So they got they have the information, but not the obedience. One of the main reasons that this problem does not go away is greed. Wanting to live a lifestyle of indulgence. Buying things you don't need with money you don't have to impress people you don't know. And so they keep themselves spinning with all the commercials and all the advertisements and you can't do without this and this is now new and improved and they gravitate and greed takes over. And then there's another reason and that is 
for planning. And I will show you what the scripture says about that. So now I am going to walk you through three words. And if I can get you to believe God's word, because I'm going to give you the three words from the Bible. If I can get you to buy into these three words, apart from trials that God may send your way or allow you to experience, you will begin to see a reversal of financial consequences where you're living your life in debt and this thing this evil has got people by the throat and strangling them to death most people think when they're in this situation I just need more money I, I need to make more money I need a better job so what they will do is jump outside of God's will to get more money thinking that more money solves the problem. But if you get more money with the same mind and that's why you have rich people who go bankrupt and if, if you got the same mind that all you're going to do given time is revert to the same situation. These three words will begin a process of rolling back the consequences of debt. Give, save, spend. Those are the three, three simple words. Give, save, spend. Honor God, honor yourself, and then spend what you have. If you're going to reverse the consequences of debt, then you must establish God as your source. You see, for most people, even Christians, they may use the word, but God is not their source. Their job is their source. Their bank is their source. The stock market is their source. Their 401 is their source. But if you make it your source rather than merely a resource, then that means you're depending on that to fix your problem. And that is idolatry. And thou shalt have no other God before me, even your job. You must establish God as your source. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 23, God said to his people, you are to bring the tithe to me to demonstrate that you take me seriously. He says, I want to see whether you recognize me as your source. And the way you do it is not by just saying you do it. The way you do it is by honoring me with the first fruits, which was the tithe, the first fruits of what I give you as proof that you are seriously believing that I am your source. Reminds me of Danny Simpson. Danny Simpson robbed the bank. True story. Robbed the bank in Ottawa, Canada. He robbed the bank and he stole $6,000. The gun he used to rob the bank with was a 1918 semi-automatic Colt worth $100,000. He did a $6,000 robbery using a $100,000 gun. The problem is, he didn't know what he had in his hand. Because if he would have known what he had in his hand, it wouldn't be worth going to jail for $6,000. If you knew who you had in your hand. Once God becomes your source, you're no longer owned by your resource. See that? that resource doesn't own you anymore. Because God can use any source he wants. Any resource he wants once he's your source. It changes everything. Okay, so, moving along. You establish God's ownership first. Secondly, you save before you spend. You do not save if you have it left over. It's like you do not give if you have it left over. 
you honor God, then you honor yourself. The Bible says it is a wicked man who does not leave an inheritance for his children's children. You're supposed to be taking, helping to take care of your grandkids. We're not leaving our kids an inheritance. We're leaving them dead. In fact, we're leaving a whole country of kids dead at $20 trillion. No, 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 no. You save first. The scripture says in Proverbs 21, 20, in chapter 30, verse 25, save before you spend. You honor God, then you honor you. You do not live your life and work your life for everybody else and you lose. You must develop a mindset that having honored God, you honor you through saving. Joseph told Pharaoh, you got to save up front for when the bad days come. It is denying expenditures today so you have something tomorrow. For who knows what another day will bring. But if you spend, 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 you can't save, save, save. And you have nothing to show for your work, your labor. Dr. Evans will come back to tell us about the next step in the process when he continues our message in just a moment. First, though, what you're hearing today is just one part of Tony's life-changing series, U-Turn, Reversing Spiritual Consequences. This collection will teach you what it takes to turn your life in a whole new direction, even if you've spent years dealing with issues like financial responsibility, substance abuse, sexual promiscuity, or family sins that go back generations. To expand on these lessons, Tony has just written a helpful companion book titled U-Turns, Reversing the Consequences in Your Life. Together, these two resources can help you finally discover how to reverse flaws and failures that you thought were irreversible. Request them right away, and we'll send you the book and all 12 lessons in the U-Turn series on both CD and digital download as our gift when you make a donation to help support Tony's ministry. And if you're wanting to gain an even deeper understanding of this important subject, Dr. Evans has produced an in-depth U-Turns Bible study kit and DVD featuring custom content for six sessions, including tips on how to lead a group study on this topic. You can find out how to get this entire package of U-Turn resources when you visit us at TonyEvans.org. Again, that's TonyEvans.org. Or let one of our resource team members help you with your request, day or night, at 1-800-800-3222. That's 1-800-800-3222. Well, Dr. Evans will come back with more of today's message right after this. What if the church led the way towards racial reconciliation? What if God's people routinely offered the gospel as the remedy to the hatred that plagues our society? What if the loudest voice for truth and love and justice came from those across racial lines who profess Jesus as Lord. The answer is that nothing would be able to stop the advancement of God's kingdom. That's the call Dr. Tony Evans issues in his book, Oneness Embraced. Get your copy of Oneness Embraced today. Now, to save means there must be a shift. It means you must become future-oriented. See, if you're not future-oriented, see, kids tend not to be future-oriented. They want now. They, they, oh, everything they want, they want it right now. Because they're not thinking about the future. They're just thinking about now. But their mamas and daddies are supposed to know better. Even when it comes to eternity, he says you must be future oriented. Now, after you've established God as your source, after you've become future oriented, because what stops being future oriented is spending it all now. Then you spend. You spend. But you spend according to scripture with a plan. Proverbs 16.3 Proverbs 21.5 God honors the plans it says of the diligent. We don't even give God something to bless. Oh just bless me. And the proof that we don't give God something to bless 
in order to get our needs met is folk play the lottery. No, you give God a plan with what you have left, Proverbs 16, 3, 21, 5, and you do it in this order. So here it is. Let me give you the order for spending, the biblical order. I'm not making stuff up. The biblical order for you to spend. Number one, you start with needs. The Bible says, to be content with your needs being met, the essentials of life, food, clothes, and shelter. Philippians 4.19 is a great promise in scripture. And it promises to those who had their things in order, he says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. He is a need meeting God. He loves to meet needs. You start with needs. Then you graduate to wants. A want is a higher level of need. For example, I need transportation. That is a legitimate need because we have to work. You don't need a Benz. <laughs> what you need is dependable transportation. You live in a nice apartment, but you want a five-bedroom, four-car garage, ten-acre house. That is fine, but you better give thanks there is a roof over your head. That you're not sleeping under a bridge. Then comes desires. Desires are things outside of any of those areas that you do with surplus. God is not against desires. He even says, I will give you the desires of your heart. I know this is hard to accept for many, but it's like getting in shape. It's hard, but when you start losing weight, it's worth it. So this means a resetting, a recalibrating of your priorities. It may mean selling your desires so that you can adjust your wants to make sure you've met your needs. Selling your desires, if it's necessary, and start again the right way. Okay, so let's close, but let's go back to our lady in 2 Kings 4. The creditors are knocking at the door. She is desperate.
recognizing that this is a spiritual issue and not just a financial issue, she goes to Elijah and says, I'm stuck. Elijah asked her two questions in verse 2. He says, what shall I do for you? In other words, what do you need? And tell me, what is in your house? What do you have? Wait a minute, Elijah. I told you the credit is at the door. So I need to be able to pay off my bills. That's what I need. In fact, Elijah, if you really want to know the truth, I, all I got is some oil. There's some oil in my, in my, in my pantry. That's it. There's some oil in my pantry. I don't have anything. Creditors don't want oil. Show me the money. That's what the creditors want. Show me the money. Elisha says, here's what I want you to do. Go to your neighbors and borrow from them all their empty pots and don't borrow a few. Get as much, watch this, of your neighbor's emptiness. Empty pots. Get, get all the emptiness and bring it to your house. Just tell them you want to borrow that pot for a little bit. When you borrow that pot, he goes on to say, then go into a room and shut the door. Why? Because what God's going to do, he's going to do in secret. This is not for public consumption. Then I want you to pour the oil into the empty pots. Pour the oil into the empty pots that you borrow from your neighbors. So she went, she got him. She starts pouring oil into the empty pot and this pot gets full and she pours oil, this pot, this pot, this pot, this pot. This oil keeps coming. This oil keeps coming. She tells her son, go get me another pot. He says, mama, that's all the pots we have. Once that happened, bam, the oil stopped. All she thought was she has a, a little jar of oil in her closet, but God had not been attached to the oil, so she had no idea of what God could do with a little when it got attached to God to turn it into something totally different. Guess what I'm trying to tell you? The solution to your debt you may already have be looking at it and not even know it's there because God never got hooked up with it. But when God got hooked up to the oil, she is filling the vessels. He says, now go back and sell to your neighbor oil. And then you and your sons can live on the rest. Retire. Girlfriend is gone from debt to an entrepreneurial program in one day with retirement benefits. All off of a jar of oil. Because what I'm trying to tell you is when you get in line with God and God begins to move, he can do exceedingly, abundantly above all you can ask or think. Luke 6.38 says, give and it, the thing you give, will be added back to you. It will be pressed down, running over, because other people will circle. If God was talking in today's language, he would say, if you do this thing right, what goes around comes around. Because Whatever you need, he says, give it to somebody else. Find a neighbor you can deliver it to, even if it's just a dollar, to somebody who needs a cup of coffee or helping somebody. Go. You do that because when you send it out, God works that thing back around so that it boomerangs back to you. What I'm trying to tell you is we're dealing with a debt-canceling God if you get back in line with him. Dr. Tony Evans with some encouraging insight on how God can help reverse the consequences of debt. As I mentioned earlier, today's teaching is just one part of 12 powerful, life-changing lessons in the comprehensive two-volume U-Turn series. And it's available along with Tony's brand new book, U-Turns, Reversing the Consequences in Your Life. For a limited time, we'll send you both these resources as our gift when you help us keep Tony's teaching on this station. Just visit TonyEvans.org today to make your donation and request your copy of the U-Turn series. 
And don't forget to look into obtaining the Companion U-Turns Bible Study Kit, including the DVD featuring six video lessons from Dr. Evans. Drop by TonyEvans.org today or call our Resource Center at 1-800-800-3222. Team members are standing by to help you day and night. Again, that's 1-800-800-3222. Even though we know worry does nothing but eat us up inside, Sometimes we just can't seem to stop. But that stronghold can be broken. And on Monday, Dr. Evans will tell us how. Be sure to join us. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is brought to you by The Urban Alternative and is celebrating 40 years of faithfulness thanks to the generous contributions of listeners like you. City, in the harbor of New York City, stands a lady. Inscribed on Lady Liberty, as you so well know, are these words Give me your tired and your poor. Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Send these, the homeless tempest toss, to me. I lift my lamp.
beside the golden door. On Lady Liberty's crown are seven spikes, reflecting seven seas and seven continents, where the invitation stands open to all to come to freedom. At the base of Lady Liberty is a chain that has been broken. She stands there in the harbor of New York to represent what this nation was to be founded upon and the nature of how it operates. She's called Lady Liberty because she stands for freedom. Freedom is not something that belongs to a country or nation. Freedom is something that God offered in the Garden of Eden. From every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Paul has made it clear in one of our previous discussions that it was for freedom Christ has set you free. He set you free to be free. He didn't set you free to stay in bondage. And yet, many of us today find ourselves bound. Personal bondages, known as addictions, the biblical phrase for it, strongholds, things that are holding us hostage and keeping us from being what we know God wants us to be. I'm not talking about the person who doesn't care now. I'm not talking about the person who's in rebellion. I'm talking about the person who really wants to be free. They want to leave where they are and get to where they're supposed to go. And you're looking for freedom. There are relational bondages where people are bound to people that they shouldn't be bound to or known as codependency or people wanting to know do I have to stay in this relationship am I stuck here am I bound to this unhappy situation I find myself in and they are longing to be free there are circumstantial bondages that people find themselves in whether it's economic and they're bound by the reality of not having enough or barely having enough to make ends meet. Or maybe there are physical realities where they're bound to feeling bad because of circumstances happening within their bodies and they long to be free from the disease. Freedom or the desire for freedom comes in all shapes and all sizes. We have explained freedom does not mean no restrictions. Freedom means being released from illegitimate restrictions. You're not free to live in water because you weren't created for that. So you're bound by air and land. So, so freedom doesn't mean the absence of restrictions, it just means the removal of illegitimate restrictions. God in the garden gave a restriction from every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree in the midst of the garden you may not. That is off limits. That is a legitimate restriction. So the issue in freedom is not whether there's restriction versus no restriction. When you watch the football game, there will be restrictions. There will be boundaries so that the game can be free to be played. No boundaries, there's chaos in the stadium. It is the removal of illegitimate boundaries. So the question to discuss freedom is, is this boundary legitimate or illegitimate? And one of the things that you will always know about freedom, and that is that boundaries will always enhance it, never destroy it, if it's a legitimate boundary. 
Having said all we've said, and we've talked about freedom, up, down, in and out, how do we conclude? Jesus Christ has now gone public. He is now asserting who he is as the Son of God and the Son of Man, all God, all man, and one person. The most unique person who has ever entered history. There is nobody like Jesus Christ. He is not one among many. You can't say Muhammad and Jesus as though they are uh, equals or Buddha and Jesus or Confucius and Jesus or you and Jesus. He is to be compared with no one because there's no other name other than the name of Jesus that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. He is in a class by himself. He is fully God, but he's also fully man. As a man, his job was to represent God in history. And so he got hungry because he was a man. He said, I thirst because he was a man. He had to sleep because he was a man. But he could walk on water because he was God. He could raise the dead because he was God. He could, so so he, 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 could, he could move in his humanity based on his relationship to deity. He comes to the synagogue in the neighborhood where he grew up, Nazareth. And they hand him the book of Isaiah and he turns the pages and comes to Isaiah chapter 61 and then he quotes it or reads it. He says in verse 18 of Luke 4, as he's reading Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is on me and he has anointed me to preach good news, the gospel. The word gospel means good news. When we talk about the gospel, we're talking about good news. That's what it means. The Huon Gelion, that is the good message, good news. And it was good news about freedom. He says, I have good news for poor people. He says, I've got good news to captives. I've got good news to the blind. And I've got good news to the oppressed. All of them need to be freed from something. The poor from poverty. The captives from their captivity. The blind from sightlessness. The oppressed from their slavery. He says, I have come to declare good news and the Spirit of God is upon me and has anointed me. When he says that he has been anointed, it means he has been duly dubbed. He has been identified and recognized by God through the Holy Spirit to proclaim good news. Jesus Christ has good news to you and me today about freedom. And he has, he's the authorized representative of God as a man to tell other men and women the good news of freedom. In the Old Testament, to be anointed meant to be dubbed. David was anointed as king. That means he was one recognized as to having been identified with God, by God, as the new leader for Israel or as the next priest. He has been selected, if you will. Jesus Christ has been uniquely selected to proclaim to people 
good news about freedom. And the Spirit is backing him up. The Spirit of God is upon me. In other words, this is a supernatural offer. This isn't folk talking to other folk about freedom. This is a supernatural offer. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, has come here today based on his word to make a supernatural offer because he's been authorized to do so. I made a phone call for uh, and a repair I needed at my home and I called and I was trying to get it worked out where the person uh, would work out the repair and I needed some other things done and her statement was, Sir, I'm going to have to get my supervisor because I'm not authorized to do that. I haven't been anointed. In other words, uh, there has been no recognition that I can give you what you're asking for. Now, I sincerely ask her. She sincerely wanted to help, but she didn't have the anointing. She, she, she was not duly dubbed and recognized as having the capacity to give me what I needed to fix what was broke in my house. She called her supervisor to the phone. Her supervisor, a gentleman, came to the phone and I explained to him the situation that I was having to get rectified and he said, I, I am not authorized to do what you're asking me to do. I, 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 I somewhat evangelically ticked off, said, because you know, them phone calls can last a long time. And, 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 and so I, I said, well, can you get me somebody who has the authority, the authorization, the power to respond to my need? I got something broke. I need something fixed. But everybody I'm talking to, they want to help me, but they can't help me because they haven't been authorized. To, I need somebody with some power, some clout, who has been anointed to be able to speak. I, I don't need somebody that's got to go to somebody else, has got to go to somebody else, has got to go to somebody else, has got to go to somebody else. I want to get to the right person who has been duly authorized to fix my broke down situation. Finally, I got somebody on the line who had been anointed, who had the power to take care of what a lot of other folks wanted to help me with, but were incapable of solving. See, a lot of us been seeking freedom in all the wrong places. We've been going to scenarios that maybe want to help, would like to help, but they've not been anointed. They are not duly authorized to be able to set you free. But Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is on me. And I have been duly authorized. I have been anointed in order to set the captives free or to proclaim good news. And so, so I'm closing this series today with some gospel. That means good news. Some good news that freedom is staring you right in the face. And I, I don't know what you need to be free from, but whatever it is, I know somebody who's duly authorized to offer it. Jesus opens the Bible and says, I've been duly authorized. Some of you, some of us have been trying to be free from something for years. You name it, and there's somebody in here that has it. It may be pornography, it may be gambling, it may be drugs, it may be alcohol, it may be cigarettes, it may be a cursing tongue, it may be an illegitimate relationship, it may be whatever it is. You've been trying for years. You, you've been like a hamster. You ever seen a hamster on a wheel? It's trying to go somewhere. That, that hamster is trying to go somewhere. Sometimes it goes slow and sometimes it goes fast. It's trying, but all it is is going in circles. 
It's going in circles because it's been boxed in a cage. You know what that hamster needs? It needs somebody to reach in there and pick it up out of its situation. Because no matter how hard it tries and how fast it goes, it will never be any further when it finishes than when it started. Why? Because it's boxed in to an enslaved situation. But if somebody that's not locked in can reach in and lift it out, it can deliver it from its wheel kind of life. And somebody's been churning on a wheel and you tired of running in the same spot. But I know somebody who's been duly authorized and anointed with supernatural power to set captives free. There's some here today and people that you know who feel like it's hopeless. This is my lot in life and I'm just going to muddle through try to make it, get by the best that I can, and you've given up on ever thinking about being free. In other words, you've gotten used to slavery. You've gotten used to whatever mental, emotional, physical incarceration you're going through. This has become your lot in life. This is just the way it is. You know... How many have gone to Disneyland or Disney World? You've been to either one of those two, okay? Most of you. You know, after about two or three hours in Disneyland and Disney World, you begin to think that all that stuff has been sized correctly. Now, in other words, these are miniature buildings. When you walk in there, these are miniature buildings. But if you're there long enough, it looks normal. Because that's all you're surrounded with. So it looks like this is the way it's supposed to be. Till you come back out. And you're faced with the real deal about the real size of things. In other words, you can be duped into thinking this is how things are supposed to be. Because you've been hanging there for two, three, four, five, or all day. You've been hanging out there, so this is the way it's supposed to be. When that's not the real world, you've been duped to think that's the real world because you've been hanging there too long. Jesus Christ says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to proclaim good news. The gospel is good news. It is good news about eternity because when you trust Jesus Christ, that means you're on your way to heaven. When you go to the cross for the forgiveness of sins, you're on your way to heaven. That's good news. It's good news to know the thing you fear most will never happen. Death. Most people, if, if they gave their greatest fear, would be to die. The good news of the gospel is you will never die. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. As soon as you die, you won't be dead long enough to know you died. Because you are immediately ushered into the presence of the Lord. So the thing you fear most, or most people fear most, is the thing that will never ever happen. Because immediately you usher into the presence of the Lord if you've come to Jesus Christ for salvation. But the good news is bigger than heaven. Uh, uh, bigger is not the better word because heaven is eternal, eternal. But it is more than heaven. The good news includes earth. Please notice the passage. He says, I've come to proclaim good news to the poor. Now, if you're poor, what's good news? That something is going to address your poverty. That something is going to change your status in life. If you're poor, that means something better is coming along. That's, that's good news. If, 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 you, if you're poor and you hear next week you're going to be poorer, that's bad news. 
If you're in captivity, the good news is that you are going to be released, that somebody has posted bail. If you're in jail and somebody posts bail, that's good news, that you're going to be released from your captivity. If you're blind and now you know you're going to get to see, that's good news. If you're oppressed, somebody's got their foot on your neck, on your back, and you've discovered now that you're going to be released from that oppressive situation, that's good news. But this is not just about heaven because you aren't poor in heaven. You aren't oppressed in heaven. You aren't blind in heaven. These are earth's issues. Now when people write about this passage, you'll see two extremes. There will be the spiritual interpretation that none of this is physical, it's spiritual poverty, it's spiritual captivity, it's all spiritual. So it doesn't relate to people's social condition, it doesn't relate to people's to slavery in America or in South Africa, it doesn't relate to that, it's all spiritual. Then you've got the liberation theology that makes it all social. Come to Jesus and he'll change the uh, economics of the day and he'll change the social structures of the day and he'll change the political environments of the day. And to pick either extreme is to miss the point. Jesus starts off with, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. So he starts off spiritual, but his spiritual perspective goes to a practical reality. I am glad that Jesus Christ and my relationship with him is going to take me to heaven. I'm glad about that. But I'm also glad that my relationship with him can affect circumstances in history. To affect circumstances in history and I miss out on eternity, well, that's not good. If a man, if a man doesn't have a place to stay, that's bad, but he can recover from that. If a person doesn't have the best food to eat, that's bad, but he can recover from that. If a person doesn't have the nicest clothes, that's bad, but he can recover from that. If a person doesn't have a great job and a living, is living on minimum wage, that's bad, but he can recover from that. But if a man or woman dies without a relationship with Jesus Christ, you just hit him with a blow he can never recover from. So merely to say that this is a social uh, uh, reality is not good enough. On the other hand, to tell me that Jesus can get me to heaven, but he's not much benefit to me on my way there. To tell me that I got a home in heaven, but he can't give me a home on earth. To tell me that, uh, you know, up in heaven, I got shoes, you got shoes, all God's children got shoes, but I got to go bare feet on earth. To tell me I've got a white robe up there, but I can't get a coat down here. Would seem to suggest that Jesus Christ is so other world minded that he can't practically meet me where I am today. To understand how all this fits together, you have to understand the last phrase in verse 19. He says, I've come to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus said, I have come to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now, to what does that refer? Every Jew there understood what Jesus was talking about. Look at verse 20. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Okay, wait a minute. He just, all he did was read the scripture. How are you going to be paralyzed? That's fixed on him. Bug-eyed on him. How are you going to be fixed on him? All he did was read the Bible. Because he understood when he quoted Isaiah 61, they understood the implications because the Jews were captive under Rome when he read this. They were looking for Messiah 
who would deliver them. In fact, the Jews in Israel today are still looking for Messiah because they rejected Jesus. So they're looking for somebody to deliver them in their Middle Eastern dilemma. I've been over to Israel six times and, and every time I've gone or taken a group over there, the guide would always say, we're waiting for Messiah. Because when Messiah comes, he's going to bring peace to the Middle East and he's going to change this situation. We are waiting. Because they understood back then and they understand today that it would be Messiah, which means the anointed one, who would bring deliverance to our historical dilemma. What they're waiting for is the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, what that refers to is Leviticus chapter 25. It was called the year of Jubilee. Let me just tell you a little something, something about the year of Jubilee. Because what Jesus is offering them, and guess what? What he's offering you is Jubilee. In Leviticus chapter 25, here's what Jesus says. Or here's what God says, beginning with verse 8. You are also to count off seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years, so that you have the time of the seven Sabbaths of years, namely 49 years, seven times seven. You then shall sound a ram's horn abroad on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, you shall sound a horn all through the land. You shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim a release. Remember, release to the captives. A release through the land to all the inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. And each of you shall return to his own property. Each of you shall return to his family. You shall have the 50th year as a jubilee. You shall not sow nor reap its aftergrowth, nor gather in from its untrimmed vines, for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy for you. You shall eat its crops of the field. On this year of jubilee, each of you shall return to his own property. Property. If you make a sale, moreover, your friend or buy from your friend's hand, you shall not wrong one another corresponding to the number of years of jubilee verse 17 so you shall not wrong one another but you shall fear god for i am the lord your god let me tell you about the year of jubilee or the acceptable year of the lord the lord's year okay this is the lord's year he says every 49 years you are to proclaim the year of jubilee because over this period of time, society will be set back. They're, you're going to get in debt. Uh, you're going to lose property. Some people will have sold themselves into slavery. He will go into that later on in that chapter about the setting the slaves free. He says things are going to get out of whack. So every 49th year, I want you to introduce the year of Jubilee where I'm going to put stuff right again that y'all have messed up. Every 49th year, I'm going to change your jacked up situation by declaring a year of liberation, a year of Jubilee. Let me tell you a little bit about the year of Jubilee. In the year of Jubilee, all debts were canceled. Wouldn't somebody like a year of Jubilee? In the year of Jubilee, whatever bills were owed were now canceled. And you started all over again. In the year of Jubilee, all slaves had to be set free and released. Property was returned to its original owner. Because this was the Lord's Jubilee. It was a celebration that released from debt, released from slavery, released from uh, uh, illegitimacy, and God was now putting things right again, setting people free. Jesus said, I have come to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say God wants to offer you Jubilee. And that's good news. The acceptable year of the Lord. The year that the Lord wants to come and make stuff right for you again. 
Some of us are in debts that we shouldn't be in. And God says, I got good news. <laughs> I've got good news for you who are in impressive situations. I've got good news. I've got good news for you who are, who are, 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 are in addictions. I've got good news. My good news is the acceptable year of the Lord. But I hear what you're saying. You're saying, but pastor, I can't wait 49 years. I can't wait seven times seven. Read verse 21. He said to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, he told his audience, you don't have to wait any longer. You don't have to wait and hope next year is better. You don't have to wait to January 1 to make New Year's resolutions. God says, today, right here, right now, is your jubilee. So these folk are staring at him like he crazy, like some of you are staring at me like I'm crazy. He's so crazy. You mean I've been dealing with this thing all these years and you talking about today? You talking about right, 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 right now? He says, today. Now let me give you the bad news before I close again with the good news. The bad news is that they didn't get free. That's the bad news. The bad news is that they didn't get delivered. The bad news is that that situation didn't change. Well, how can he say today and nothing got better for the Jewish people? And they're still not better. Because he said, I have come to proclaim good news. Underline proclaim. I'm going to give you the good news. But you must accept the good news for the good news that I tell you about to become good news for you. In other words, you can hear good news and amen good news, praise the Lord good news, hallelujah good news, and in God great good news, and not experience the good news for you. You see, back in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 9, when God says, this shall be a jubilee with you, it was inaugurated with the Day of Atonement. In other words, you didn't get the social until you got the spiritual. Okay, is everybody with me? The Day of Atonement was when you got right with God. He says, when you get right with me, Day of Atonement, debts will be canceled. Slaves will be released. Families will be put back together again, he says in the passage. If you skip the Day of Atonement, in order to get the social benefits of Jubilee, you don't get the spiritual and you lose out on the social. See, a lot of people who want God to do stuff in history don't want a, the day of atonement. They want to skip the spiritual and get right to God pay my bills. Get right to God get me out of this addiction. Get right to God fix my family. Get right to God make this better when they have skipped the thing that inaugurates the day. If the spiritual is not foundational, if the spiritual is not the first thing, if the spiritual is not priority, if the spiritual gets thrown by the wayside, if all that matters to you when you come to church is to hear the sermon, you're not going to get jubilee. In fact, the most important thing that happens in our church is not the sermon, it's communion because that's atonement. Because it is there at the cross that I reestablish my relationship with Christ, where I'm forgiven for my sins for sanctification, where I recommit myself to follow under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That happens at the cross. That doesn't happen in the sermon. 
But people want the sermon without the cross and wonder why they're not free. The day of atonement had to precede the experience of freedom. Today, I deliver this message in your hearing. I am the anointed one. That is, I have the power to grant release based on your response to me. The reason why the Jews didn't get free was they rejected him, but they wanted freedom. You cannot sideline Jesus and get victory. You can't sideline Jesus and get freedom. You can't sideline Jesus and be released. You can't be a secret agent Christian and be released. That comes with the full recognition of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And if Jesus Christ doesn't have say so in your life, Lordship, rule, control, if the relationship spiritually is not the priority, then don't expect to get the release that he's talking about. And the release that he's talking about, he's offering it today. Today. The anointing. Yeah, let me, let me say this. The anointing is closer than you think. Because if you're here this morning and you're a Christian, Christ is in you. You got people wandering around here saying, I wish I was anointed. Well, 1 John 2.20 says, you are. It says, if you're a Christian, you have the anointing. The anointed one has already anointed you. Because the anointed one, if you are a Christian, is living inside of you. You, you have the anoint. You looking for something you already have. I was looking for my keys. You know how frustrating it is when you can't find your keys. You're in a hurry. You got to go somewhere. You got an appointment. And you, first of all, you're frantic. So you go. You're just looking everywhere. You're looking everywhere. You're looking everywhere. And, and you're just, just bouncing around. Then you say, okay, this is not working. Let me structure my search. And so now you structure it and you go from room to room, from spot to spot, and, you know, and you're trying to find it. Okay, okay, the structure doesn't work. So now you're looking in, in places where you would, maybe it fell between the pillars and the couch. And, you know, so now you're looking and, and, and it's, it's, it's so frustrating. I couldn't find my keys. I'm late. I'm going nowhere because I can't find my car keys. In the midst of my frustration... I throw up my hands and hit my side. I pull the keys out of my pocket. Because I'm searching for something I already have. I'm searching for something I already have. I'm searching for something I already possess. You already have the check. Cash it. Jesus Christ is already set up to set you free. He's already proclaiming freedom to the captives. But the day of atonement, that is your relationship spiritually, will determine your freedom in all the dimensions of your life. If the spiritual is out of whack, don't expect the social to get ordered. Harry Houdini, you know him. The famous escape artist. He bragged that he could escape from anywhere. Anywhere. And they said, well, we have a cell you can't escape out of, Houdini. He said, bring it on. They took him to this cell and he had this metal object he would always use to pick locks and to break out. He took out the object and he began to work it and work it and work it. But it wasn't working this time. It wasn't working this time. He took off his shirt and began to work it 
and work it. He wasn't working. He took off his t-shirt because he's sweating. He's now four hours into this thing and the great Houdini is stuck. It's not that he's not trying. It's not that he's not sweating and making a resolution, I'm going to break out of here. It just wasn't working. He threw down his metal thing and just fell against the door and it flew open. He was trying to unlock something that was already unlocked. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. On the cross, Jesus unlocked the cell and you fighting to get what you already have. And that is freedom.